Acts 9, 19 to 31. For some days he, Saul, was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and multiplied. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Jesus, this is a story that catches our attention. Saul was the least likely of people to have ever recognized your goodness, to ever have recognized the truth about who you are and who you say we are. And yet this story rings true. History bears the truth of it. So now, Lord, as we read what happens to Saul in the immediate days of him coming to Jesus, I ask, would you open our eyes to see where you are? Would you open our ears to hear your voice speaking to us this morning? Would you remove the obstacles that stand in between us and you, that we would meet with you, Jesus, as we have already have been, but we would see you new and afresh, beckoning us to you? Jesus, thank you that you are king, that you reign above all. Thank you for this story and how our stories are found in this story, too. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. I want to make sure you're awake. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Good morning, family. Good morning, friends. If this is your first time or your uh, thousandth time, welcome to All Souls Community Church, whether physically or online, and we are glad you were here. If this is your first time joining us, or if you've only been here for the last few weeks, we have been doing this thing and reading this book called Acts and talking about the mission of the Spirit. And today, before we dive into what we have for us this morning, I want to tell you a story of an old student of mine named Ryan. I've had the privilege and pleasure of serving with teenagers and young adults now for the last 15 years. And Ryan is a kid I will never forget. Um, let me say on the caveat now, uh, <laughs> sometimes we get up here and we preach and we teach and do all that kind of stuff and we cry because we feel so overcome with the moment and we see what God's doing in us and through us and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm gonna cry through this sermon, folks. <laughs> So don't mind my tears, but, and I'm not ashamed of them, but just giving you a caveat. But here we go. When I was a youth pastor back in New Jersey for a number of years, Ryan was a kid I met who was part of the church I had then joined uh, before we were there. And Ryan was a kid whose story is unfortunately horrible, but it's not too uncommon. Ryan's parents divorced when he was about nine. Um, and then long came the argument between what do we do with Ryan and where does Ryan go? Does Ryan stay with mom? Does Ryan stay with dad? Does he go with the grandparents? What do we do with Ryan? 
And you can imagine because of that, for any of you who have any experience with this or know anybody who does, lots of times children of divorce are very, very numb and very, very angry. And so Ryan, uh, because of the predicament he found in his life, decided that he could do whatever he wanted. Because who cares? And when I had met Ryan, he was coming to our church. He was a part of youth group. He was a part of the body. Um, but you could tell that there was something just off with Ryan. By his, I met him when he was in eighth grade. No, ninth grade, excuse me. Uh, and by the end of that year, we pretty much never saw Ryan again. Ryan, through the pleas and the messages of his friends, would tell us that Ryan is basically just doing whatever he wants with whoever he wants, and nobody could tell him otherwise. He thought, it's my life, and I could do whatever I want with it. And all it did was compound the hurt and the anger and the frustration and the sin and the darkness in his own life. Because he just truly believed that nobody cared and he could just do whatever he wanted. He was the master of his own destiny. But Ryan, we saw Ryan at least once a year, every year. Every July, uh, our church and the youth group would take a mission trip somewhere around the country and we would do home, reno home renovation projects. We would go and basically have mini youth group in the morning and big youth group at night. But all the time in between, we got split up into teams and we were working on people's houses, fixing their houses because they either couldn't, like they were disabled and they could not, or they could not afford to. Which, if you don't believe you can get a bunch of teenagers to go to a different part of the country and get them to fix other people's houses in the name of Jesus, pay attention. Because it happens. But that mission trip every year was the only time we saw Ryan. Interesting, right? It's the only time we saw Ryan. Ryan was really good with his hands. He had a knack for it, a definitely a gift from God. He had an engineer's mind, and the boy could run a work site by himself. He could just do it all. So every year he had come because even though he didn't care about God, he didn't care about these people, the people who we, he was going with, or the people that he was serving, this was something he was good at, and he wanted to keep doing it. And so every year, once a year, for about three years, I would always remember I would have about seven days to talk to Ryan. And that's it. Every other phone call, conversation, visit to his house, he would just ignore or keep the door closed. But every year for seven days, I would get a chance to talk to Ryan. And we had a lot of good conversations. We had conversations about Jesus. We had conversations about his parents. We had conversations where I tried desperately to just represent the gospel to him, that Jesus did love him, and Jesus had a better plan and hope and dream for his life. But there was a lot going on in Ryan's life and a lot of despair kind of crept into my heart every time I talked to Ryan because I think I have seven days with this kid the world has 358 how am I going to go up against that part of that was my own problem that as I've had to learn time and time again I don't save anybody we don't save anybody Jesus does but it's hard to combat that lie when you so desperately want to see a kid's life changed. But every year we saw Ryan, um, and every year we had good conversation, but I remember the last time I saw Ryan. It was his high school graduation. And I was there because at that particular year we had a lot of kids graduating high school at once, and so you gotta show up for those moments. And as I was making the rounds and taking pictures and congratulating people, I saw Ryan across the football field, and so we kind of came together and gave each other a hug, and you know, I said something to the effect of, you know, Ryan, no matter what happens, like, I'm here for you, you have my number, like, man, God loves you, we love you, and something to that effect. <laughs> and Ryan's like, thanks, man, appreciate it, bye. And that's the last time I ever saw Ryan. I mean that. There's no like random hook where like, oh, I saw him three years later. That's the last time I ever laid eyes on Ryan. And I remember in that moment feeling a darkness and a despair kind of creep into my heart. What I realized was happening was every time I saw Ryan, I always knew in the back of my head, I'm going to see him again. Right? No matter how this week goes, no matter how these conversations go, no matter if I'm great or if I'm effective or not, no matter what actually happens, I'm going to see Ryan again. But something inside of me knew, and I dare say it was the Holy Spirit, letting me know, you're never going to see Ryan again. And I knew. I just knew. And I had this despair in my heart. 
had this hopelessness that I was not on guard against, and it crept its way in. In 2017 or 18, I don't remember exactly when, I got a phone call from Ryan. And it was a voicemail. And he started off the voicemail saying, I have to leave this, I have to leave this as a voicemail. I can't bother to talk to you, because if I talk to you, all of the shame and guilt is just gonna come crushing back in. So he left me this voicemail, and he begged me, don't call me, don't text me, just listen to my voicemail. And Ryan tells me a story about, and I knew this was true, but Ryan tells me a story about how all through high school he was working his butt off to get good grades and to get good scholarships. Not because he necessarily cared about going to a good school, but because dad was a deadbeat and mom worked way too many jobs to just keep the lights on. There was no family, or there was no money coming from family, there was no help coming from there. And so Ryan worked his butt off. Even though he was a delinquent, even though he did a bunch of dumb things with his life, he worked his butt off to try and get good grades, to get a scholarship, to go to a decent school, to afford to be able to go to college. Because even though he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life, he thought college was it, or at least would provide the next steps. And he calls me and he says, man, I remember all those times, you and all these other people from the church and all these other kids and youth group and college kids and all that kind of just stuff would text me, would invite me, would want to talk to me about Jesus, and I just ran away. And he's like, you know, we don't have to hash that out. You and I have had long conversations about that. But what's interesting was, I thought I picked a college where there were no Jesus freaks. <laughs> and they found me. <laughs> and he says, the interesting thing that was true about my middle school and high school life is I can run away from all of you, but I can't run away from these people. They're in my dorm rooms. They're in my classes. I see them playing frisbee on the quad. I can't get away from these people. <sighs> and he says in a voice, gone, I'm so glad that Jesus knew better than I did. He calls me to tell me, Tommy, I don't have my life figured out. I still have a lot of crap to work through. But Jesus is good. And I believe and trust in him. And man, I tried calling him and texting him after that, being like, Ryan, Ryan, I got to, Ryan, this is the only conversation I ever really wanted to have with you. Yes, Ryan, but he never picked up the phone, true to his word. And I'm reminded of that moment when I saw him graduate high school where the Holy Spirit kind of told me, you're not going to see him again, and that's okay. But I'm going to see Ryan again one day. Why am I telling you this story? Is just to make you teary-eyed like I am and sobbing on a Sunday morning? No. No, we don't do emotional manipulation here. We tell you the truth. Last week, Pastor Will preached about Saul was living in a nightmare that God interrupted big time. And so was Ryan. And for a lot of us, so were we. And for some of us, we still are. But God interrupted his life to give him a much better dream when all of the muck and all of the sin and all the suffering and all of the demonic and all of the evil and everything stood against him and God. God broke through. Ryan is what I'd like to call an unlikely person who has ever believed that Jesus would bother with him. Friends, this morning, we're going to talk about the unlikely people because Ryan is one of them and so is Saul, like we have read in this week's passage and last week's passage. But this is what the Spirit is up to in and through us in regards to the unlikely people. Peace. Peace. That very elusive thing we all desperately want but don't really know how to get. Eternal, everlasting, soul-filling, and life-changing peace is established as we pursue, as we pursue the unlikely people, the Ryans and the Sauls of the world. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, we have read through nine chapters so far of the book of Acts, but I want to highlight something for you as we've gone through. We have read and discussed the story of very different types of groups, groups of people. And these people are both real people that lived, but also archetypes of people that still live today. Working backwards, back in Acts chapter 6, we see that the gospel go forth, and it says even the priests, even the priests believe in the good news of Jesus. Well, who are the priests? The priests are the ones who have been totally bought into another truth. 
and to a lie of the world. They've been wholly convinced that they are the ones who have the right worldview, that they are the ones who have figured out God. But even they, Jesus gets to. In Acts chapter 8, we see that the gospel goes forth and it says even the Samaritans believe. The Samaritans, the ethnically half-Jewish cousins of the Jews, those who are geographically, ethnically, and in truth so close to the gospel. All you have to do is Google a map between how far Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, was to Samaria. To get from one part of Israel to another, you had to walk through Samaria. That tells you how close they were. And yet these are the people the Jews would have never gone to. They were so close to the truth. And all it took was one person stepping in and saying, here it is. And they believed. Later on in that same chapter, not too long ago, we read the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, the one who is weighed down by the circumstances of his or her life. Things done to them and things, things that they do that rob them of hope and fill them with darkness. And because of all of the things that the world has thrown in their way, there seems to be so many obstacles between them and God that there's no hope. There's just no hope. They end up believing the lie that Satan throws at us time and time again. Nothing will ever change. Nothing will ever change. And yet God even breaks through through an unlikely person in Philip to preach to bring the gospel. And then as we started talking about last week, there's the Saul's of the world, the literal enemies of God, who it takes just but a moment for God to show up and say, this, this is the Jesus that you are persecuting. And their hearts are uplifted and transformed. As we even mentioned last week, their hearts of stone are turned into hearts of flesh. Why am I hashing this out for you? Because friends, we have some questions to work through this morning as we read through Acts chapter 9, and this is the first one. Who are the unlikely people God has put in your life for you to pursue? Who are the unlikely people in your life that God has called you to pursue? This is not a rhetorical question. I actually want you to ask yourself this question, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to come up with that answer. Who are the priests? The ones that everyone in their lives seems to be totally aware that they have drinking the Kool-Aid and they're the only person who hasn't realized it. The ones who are so hell-bent, that's a literal word, hell-bent, on insisting that their life and the way they live their life is the only thing that matters, is the only thing that's right. And all of us around them are sort of desperately pleading, God, please pull the wool out from over their eyes. Because this is not life that they are treading towards, but death. In Damascus, Saul was the unlikely person no one would have ever dreamed could experience transformation like, like he did. Our passage even tells us that after Saul visits Ananias and the scales fall off his eyes, he has food and drink and he gets baptized, he turns back around and goes to the town where he was going to persecute people. That's why he was going there, to put more Christians in jail and to death. And now in that same town, he goes and he starts preaching the gospel. And everyone starts talking about, wait a minute. Isn't this the guy who came to persecute those people? And now he's on their side? Hmm, that seems weird. <laughs> What's going on here, right? The little word our English translation gives us is amazed. Amazed is kind of a, a weak word nowadays. It doesn't really carry a lot of punch. In Greek, it does. They were flabbergasted. They were completely caught off guard. They were like, I, I couldn't, you couldn't have paid me enough money to believe that this would actually happen. And yet it did. He was walking around in their midst, in their synagogues, the text tells us, teaching and preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. And they are... They're at the end of themselves. They're like, what the heck just happened? Could this actually be what's happening in our midst? But all of that, Saul himself tells us later on in the New Testament. It's not anything that has to do with his own life. It has everything to do with Jesus. 
In 1 Timothy, who Saul writes to one of his own mentees, Timothy, he says this, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Amen. Of who I, this is Saul talking, of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive his eternal life. I read passages like this and I'm reminded of Ryan and that voicemail. Tommy, I can't even talk to you on the phone because I'll be reminded of all the shame and guilt that I bear. You don't think Saul carried the weight of his own sins for his life? Jesus took away the spiritual consequences and he definitely brought healing to Saul, but you don't think Saul woke up every day remembering that he persecuted the people that he's now trying to lead to Jesus? You know what kind of weight that would have been? You know what kind of crushing he would have had to endure? If you remember, God even says that in Acts 9 to Ananias. When he tells Ananias, go to Saul, I have plans for him, to go to the kings and to the people of Israel, and he will suffer much for my name's sake. But Saul himself is very much aware of the fact that, man, his life has changed. He was the worst of the worst. He was so unlikely. And because he was so unlikely, it speaks to the majesty and the grace and the power and the beauty and the love of our God. Amen. That he would find someone like Saul, like Ryan, like us, who would meet them where they're at. But as I read a story... I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I always ask myself this question. Why? Why was this the story? How did this happen? You ever think about that? I'll phrase it for you slightly differently. What caused Saul to become the kind of man he was before he encountered Jesus? This is a man that the Bible describes as a vessel of destruction. Those are not light words. Anyone want to be called a vessel of destruction? It sounds kind of cool at first, and then you're like, oh, that feels icky in the wrong kind of way. How did Saul become the kind of man he was? Saul, history tells us, is intellectually sharp. He's a man full of zeal, full of passion. He's a man full of life and vibrancy. He's a man who's very well competent, very well educated, like Pastor Will even talked about last week, being raised by one of the foremost rabbis to have ever graced the earth, Gamaliel. They still quote Gamaliel today in synagogues. That was his teacher, right? In Galatians, Saul writes of himself, for you heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. Saul himself accounts, it seems like it's boasting, but he's really just telling the truth. He's not saying he's the greatest, but he was pretty darn smart. He was pretty darn capable. He says this in Philippians chapter 3. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's being a little facetious here. He's being a little tongue-in-cheek. He's not saying we should trust our earthly capabilities. But, he says, if anybody had a reason, if such a good reason existed to trust your earthly capabilities, you're looking at them, says Saul. It's me. Why? I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Saul has the right, the word we'll use is pedigree. He has the right upbringing. He has the right status. He's part of the right people. He's part of the right family. He has all of the dominoes stacked in the right columns and in the right ways for him to achieve and succeed and be somebody in the world. How did Saul end up that way? How did Saul, a man so clearly gifted with benevolent gifts for the church, gifted by God to be used for God's people and for God's glory, how did Saul end up as a vessel of destruction? Guys, we can't paint a rosy picture of Saul before Jesus. He literally asked for permission to kill people. 
He wanted to be a sanctioned murderer. Like, what? <sighs> when I think about the life of Saul, this is what I'm reminded of. <sighs> I'm reminded of Jesus in the wilderness before he starts his earthly ministry, and he's visited by who? Satan. I'm reminded of the book of Job, which is a story about Job, and Satan tries to enter into God's heavenly courts, and he tells God, Job only loves you because of what you've given Job. It sounds like John 10.10, 10, where Jesus tells us that I have come to give them life and life to the fullest, but that's not how that verse starts. It starts with, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. It sounds like Revelation 12, where the great war between God's angels and Satan is waged. And when Satan loses, he decides to turn his attentions to people he thinks he can conquer. Us. It says the dragon, the serpent, then turns his attention to the, to the children of Eve. It sounds like God had good plans for Saul's life. And Satan knew it. Satan cannot create. Only God can. But Satan can twist and twist and twist and twist. Friends, if this is your first time here this morning, you're like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that either, to be quite honest. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, you go, man, we talk about evil a lot and the demonic a lot, don't we? Yes, we do. We don't necessarily want to, but we do. And I will tell you why. Who are the Saul's in our lives that Satan is working over time to ruin? The Bible teaches us a very concrete truth. This life, these speakers, the shirt that I'm wearing, the lives that we live, everything physical and tangible that we can touch will pass away. None of it lasts. Not a single bit. But the heavenlies and the spiritual realm and all that existed before will be all that exists afterwards too. As the Revelation tells us, there's the new heaven and the new earth. This is not more real than the spiritual world. It's a trippy thing to think about. What? But I, I can't touch the spiritual world, but I can't see what's really going on there. Not necessarily, but yes, necessarily. <laughs> but all this will pass. And Satan knows that. And so... That's a lot of times we're like, well, okay, but I can have this fancy thing in my life, and I can have that fancy thing, I can pursue this thing, and a lot of times we don't feel like we have any kind of pushback. But man, you start to want to try and go closer to Jesus and be the person that he has called you to be, and all of a sudden life gets suddenly more difficult, doesn't it? I wonder why. Have you thought about that? Who are the Saul's in our lives that Satan is working overtime to ruin? You might not think you have an answer to this question. This is the one question that we're going to ask this morning that I can guarantee you every single one of us has a Saul in his life or a Saul in her life, probably more than one. You want to know how I know? Because you have children. You have nieces and nephews. You have grandkids and great-grandkids, and you have cousins, and you have younger generations. My grandfather worked construction. And one of the very few things I remember he taught me was when you lay a foundation of concrete down, you make sure you do it right the first time because once it hardens, it is literally set in stone. For so many of us, we can feel God calling us to be who we are in Jesus, for Jesus, and because of Jesus, and we can feel that tension and that struggle. It exists on an entirely different level for those who in our lives are minors. I have the beautiful privilege, an awful privilege, of being the youth and young adult pastor here. Because every week, I'm not exaggerating, every week, I can see what he wants to do in the lives of our kids. And I guarantee you, if I asked Geraldine, our children's director too, she would agree. Friends, I'm not telling you this to make you afraid. 2 Timothy 1, also written by Saul, tells us, because of Christ Jesus, we have not been given a spirit of fear. This is not for you to be afraid. This is a wake-up call. You know who really loves your kids? God. You know who really wants to kill your kids? Satan. 
I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Because if he can get his hooks in them now, if he can get their lies in them now, they end up believing the truth that they're his. You get the Ryans of the world. We know these people. We know these stories. You can look at me and you can agree and you can look at me and you can go, uh, I don't know. You know it. So who are the Saul's in our lives that Satan is working overtime to ruin? Who are the kids in your lives that God has called you to pursue for his name's sake and glory? There's an interesting detail that happens in today's passage. It says that eventually, Saul has to leave Damascus because he's preaching so powerfully, he's confounding the enemies so resoutly that they decide to kill him. How ironic. He was on their side, and they were okay with that. And now he's not, and they want to do to him the very thing he was doing to others, but they turned a blind eye to because it kept them in power. Irony. <laughs> Hypocrisy, really. We'll go with irony. And so Saul needs to be put in a basket and dropped out of the city walls so that he can escape and he can make his way over to Jerusalem. If you know anything about your Old Testament, that reminds us of a story a very, very long time ago in the book of Joshua when God's people... Moses is gone at this point. Joshua's now in charge of God's people. And Joshua has been charged to send spies into the land. Look and see the land that I am going to give you, says God. And they go. And two spies go into the great walled city of Jericho. It's the city that history tells us the Israelites walk around seven times with their pans and their trumpets and stuff like that. And that's how the city walls fall down. And people like to decide that it had to be some kind of weird echolocation or vibration of sound, the right kind of pitch. That's how they, t they like to believe that the walls came down, even though the walls were literally thicker than this building. Because people lived in the walls. We have found apartments in the walls of Jericho. But anyway, the two spies go into Jericho. And the one who keeps them safe for when the military leaders of the city find out that there are spies in their city and they go for a manhunt, there's one person who keeps them safe who's not even an Israelite. Her name is Rahab. And Rahab keeps them safe. And because of that, Rahab lives and her family lives. But what's the weird connection here? Those spies had to be put in a basket and brought out of the wall and lowered that they may flee the coming destruction. The walls that keep us from the promise of God. Jericho, as the walled city so, so long ago, physically stood between God's people and the promised land. And I want to make sure you understand this. The promised land wasn't just the geography that God was giving them. It absolutely was. It was also the promise of his presence. God said, I will be with you in the promised land. We will be near and dear in the promised land. It's a foreshadowing of heaven. The walls that keep us between the promise of God. You know what that sounds like, friends, that Saul experienced and we experienced? The eunuchs who have very real walls, very real lies told them that I'm not good enough and all these things were done to me and I've done all these things and nobody loves me, nobody wants me. God will never bother with me. God will never come find me. God doesn't care. All of these walls that exist and are built up between them and God and them and God and all of this baggage and all of this weight that end up crippling them and crumbling them and they can't bother to go on because the burden is too much. So who are the eunuchs in our lives who have no hope? They're 20, they're 30, they're 40, they're 50, they're 60, they're 70, they're 80, they're 90, but they've been dead for a long time. Who are the eunuchs? 
who for one reason or beloved believe that there is no hope, that the wall that exists between them and the promise of God and his presence will never come down. But the Bible teaches us ours is a God who breaks down walls. He broke down Jericho. He broke down the wall that existed between God and his beloved humankind. Who are the eunuchs that God has put in your life? I hope you remember these names. If you don't think you have a good memory, write them down. Saul eventually finds his way into Jerusalem, the nexus, the heart of the church. And he gets there, and they're afraid of him. There's no technology, there's no instant messaging. They've heard the stories of Saul and how somehow he has changed, but they're afraid. They don't believe him. 2 Timothy 1.7, we have not been given a spirit of fear. They're still learning that. Sometimes so are we. And they're afraid, but it takes a man named Barnabas to stand up and testify to the truth. Barnabas lives out the truth of Acts 1.8 when God says, or Jesus says to his apostles, you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Barnabas was literally a witness. He says, hold on, guys and girls, hold on. I was in Damascus. I saw what happened to Saul. I talked to Ananias. I saw what he did every day. I was in those synagogues with him. This is a man who's been changed. And on the good testimony of Barnabas, Saul is brought into the fold. Now, I want to make something very clear. He was always in the fold in God's eyes once he had that encounter with Jesus. But sometimes us as humans, as broken and frail as we can be, are sometimes playing catch up to what God is doing. While while what they did was not right, it is understandable. And Barnabas is the one who, by his good testimony, brings Saul into the fold. Barnabas is a man who has showed up in the book of Acts a few times so far, and he will show up again a few more times. And every time he shows up, he kind of has like a spotlight moment. He kind of does a good thing that kind of propels the story forward and would not have been the same without Barnabas. Because Barnabas, his name literally means son of encouragement. Barnabas is not his real name. I don't know how many people actually know that. Barnabas is not his real name. They renamed him because he was such a son of encouragement. The guy couldn't stop encouraging people so much, they gave him a new name that was more fitting to the way he lived his life and followed Jesus. That says something. That says something about the man Barnabas. But friends, why are we talking about that? You know who needs encouragement? The Samaritans. Who are the people in your life that you have known maybe for a little bit or maybe for a long time that just seem open and receptive to what God is doing, but there always seems to be something that holds them back just a little bit? It's the times that you offer to pray for them and they go, yes, please, even though they don't believe in God. It's the times that you share with them something that is true of the Bible and they're receptive to it. And you can tell that their life has changed even just a little bit, even though they don't believe in the Bible. It's the people who are so close. They're right there. And all it takes is one of us to be like Barnabas, who really is being like Jesus, to come in and give that little nudge of witness and testimony and encouragement to say, no, that thing that you're realizing deep down inside, it's real. He's real. His name is Jesus. And if you take that plunge and trust him, you'll never regret it. Friends, who are the Samaritans in your life that are one step away from Jesus? So why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about the priests and the eunuchs and the Sauls and the Samaritans? Why are we talking about the archetypes of all of these unlikely people? Why? Because peace is established as we pursue the unlikely people. Did you catch the end of the passage? Saul has to leave Jerusalem because they're going to kill him again. (laughs) 
It ends up becoming a reoccurring theme in his life that we'll see for literally the next rest of the book. <laughs> and so he flees, and he goes back to his hometown of Tarsus. And then there's this little snapshot, this little, almost like a status update, this little, it doesn't really fit in with the story, but it kind of does, and it just gets included right there at the end of Acts 9, verse 31. And it says, the church is being built up. The fear of the Lord is spreading. The comfort of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is being experienced profoundly and more widespread. And it says that the church multiplies and has peace. Well, how did that come about? In a very real sense, it came about because the greatest enemy that existed on earth against God at that point, God took off the chessboard. There is the old saying that if you want to get rid of the snake, you behead the head. You just cut off the head, right? You go for the kill. You don't mess around. You don't trap him. You don't try and take off his tail. You go right for the jugular. And then it will be done. In a very holy way, God does the same. The one who would be the epitome, if left untouched, be the head of those who would oppose God. God comes right in and says, nope, you're mine. And peace is established. Now, that makes sense in a physical kind of thing, right? Saul was persecuting Christians, and now he isn't. Makes sense that they would experience peace. But it's not just a physical reality. It's a physical reality that reflects a spiritual principle. Like this moon has no light and only reflects the sun. There is a greater truth behind what this story shows us and why we are talking about the unlikely people. In 2 Corinthians, who, anyone want to take a guess as to who wrote that? Saul. Isn't it crazy how all the truths that we are even talking about today stem from the man whose story we finished reading today? In 2 Corinthians 5, Saul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. You could preach a million sermons on that. It's one of the most beautiful sentences in the Bible. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave us, gave us, gave us the ministry, the activity, the work of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to this message of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a really big word that basically just means this. God in the person of Jesus made things right between him and mankind. Sin and Satan would keep us apart, and God said, my wrath demands justice, and my love demands them, so I will do something about it. And he brought down justice on himself for us, because he loves us that much, because he made you for one purpose, so that he could love you. And so God in the person of Jesus does what is necessary with his life, with his death, with his resurrection, with his ascension, and with his coming again to make things right between God and mankind. He reconciled us. And now he says, as I have done, now you are to do as well. Now as I have done, you are to do this as well. This ministry, this activity, the work of reconciliation, of making things right between God and his people, now doesn't just fall on Jesus. Jesus says, now it is us. I want to use you to go after the unlikely people. I want to use you to spread the footprint of my kingdom. I want to use you to push back the darkness. I want to use you and maybe you're thinking you're maybe an unlikely person. You probably are. We all are. <laughs> but I want to use you to reach those who nobody thinks could possibly be reached. I want you to pursue the unlikely people. And as I do that, there will be peace. When I got that phone call from Ryan, or I got that voicemail, excuse me, as I cried and I wept, I sensed something happening in my heart. That hopeless tendril that had creeped in was yanked back out that hopeless despair that wanted to settle somewhere in my heart and try to be hidden and never get dealt with was scooped right up in that moment. Because as I came to understand that Jesus was working behind the scenes the entire time, he brought peace to me. I've never seen Ryan, and I firmly believe I'll never see him again until heaven. 
But there's a peace in my heart knowing the kingdom has spread because Jesus has won in that boy's life. And there's something that we all desperately need from Jesus. It's a lot of things, but the one I want to highlight is peace. It's peace. You may have noticed, this says 17 to 21, but I stopped halfway through. Why? We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal, God was making his case like a lawyer presents, presents evidence. God is making his appeal through who? Us. Us. As Jesus and as the Holy Spirit work in the world to win hearts and souls back to God, as a good lawyer, he brings up evidence number one and he points to you. Look what I've done in their lives. Look what I've done through their lives. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's powerful stuff. That is powerful stuff that God has declared he wants to do in and through us. So who are the priests? Who are the Saul's? Who are the Samaritans? Who are the eunuchs in your lives today that are not there by accident? God doesn't just happen to work in coincidence. It looks like coincidence in us. That's because we're looking from this angle up. We have one final thing to say. Some of you have been listening to me here. We'll talk through this passage, give this sermon, tell you my stories. And you think that's good, fine, and dandy. I believe some of it. I believe all of it. But some of it is not just landing the way I thought it would. Some of it seems kind of confusing. Some of it seems kind of jarring, like a bunch of pennies in a jar that are too big for the jar or too big for the pennies, and you rattle, and it's like, dee, 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 dee. you're like, oh, something feels unpleasant about that. What's going on in here? I would dare say this. There are some of us in this room, and there are some of us watching online, who are the Saul's. Who are the priests? Who are the eunuchs? Who are the Samaritans? And this story seems funny to you, not because it's wrong, but because it seems a little too close to home. From the quote-unquote worst sinner of all sinners himself, know this truth, friends. Today, you can be reconciled to God. Not because of anything you can do or anything that you need to do. Not whatever your past is or whatever your future might look like. It's simply this. He who was, had no sin was made to be sin for us. Jesus pours out his immense love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you because he loves you and he will not see heaven without you. As far as he is concerned, he will not see heaven without you. It is a free gift, freely given, that cost everything. No, that sentence is not a paradox. It is a free gift, freely given, that has cost everything. So friends, if you find yourself in the position that you're like, maybe I'm a Saul, maybe I'm a eunuch, maybe I'm a Samaritan, maybe I'm a priest, maybe I don't even remember what all those archetypes were, that's fine. But if you feel and you are understanding in this moment that there is something now right between me and God, don't let today be any different than any other Sunday where we invite you and we say, you can have a conversation with God about that now. God has been meeting you where you're at even as we've talked and sung, and God wants to continue to meet with you now because he loves you. And he wants what's best for you, and what's best for you is him. It's him. Amen. Friends, the church experiences peace. The church is built up and multiplied, and the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit spread when we pursue the unlikely people. Will we pursue the unlikely people? That is a question you must answer. I cannot answer it for you. This would be one of those great moments where we go, okay, everyone repeat after me, and we kind of do this thing, and we get all jazzed up, and we're like, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to pursue those people. Yes. We could do that. I don't want to do that. And here's why. Because like I said at the beginning, 
we're not going to do all this emotional manipulation. We're not. You have to ask yourself the question deep in your heart and reckon with the God who loves you and made you. You have been called and equipped and empowered by the Spirit of the living God to pursue the unlikely people and bear the ministry of reconciliation. God has given you that charge. And because God has given you that charge, he will give you everything you need, which is all the things you don't have, to see it come true, and that's him. That's him. Who are the unlikely people in your life, friends? They're waiting for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the story of Saul. It's not an easy story, but it is a beautiful story of a man who seems so far gone from you that others would look at him and think there is no way his life is ever going to change. And it did because of you. Jesus, today we ask for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. That that would be the thing that empowers us to hear the call, to respond to the charge and say, yes, Jesus, count me in. I will pursue those who need you. It might cost me. It might hurt me. It might not be desirable. It may not even be fun. But what a beautiful responsibility and privilege you've given us to walk hand in hand with our God as he literally changes the world one human heart at a time. Jesus, for those of us who have trusted in your name and have given our hearts and our souls and our lives over to you, would we walk out of here, this building, or log off online, whatever that time may be, ready with eyes open and hands ready to receive the people you have put in our lives that we are going to pursue. Because Jesus, you are not a God of confusion. You are not a God who works against himself. The people in our lives are not there by accidents. And so we will go. We will go. And the strength and the might of our Holy Spirit with the splendor and wonder of the majesty of our God. And we will see lives changed. Not because we have the right words or training. Not because we're that charismatic. But simply because we go with you. God, we will see the priests and their stubborn hearts melted before you. God, we will see the eunuchs and their baggages and walls thrown into the trash. Never to be erected again. God, we will see the Samaritans find the thing that they have so desperately been looking for, and that is you, Jesus. And we will find the Saul's. Oh, we will find the Saul's. The ones who are so adamant against you. The ones who don't want to be anywhere near you. And we will see their hearts change too. Holy Spirit, make this a place where we are a people who pursue the unlikely and would our very doors and our very lives be full of those unlikely people coming to you? Would we be surprised, Jesus, by how swift and evident your move is in us? Would we be surprised and delighted, Jesus, that it just took one conversation and you did the rest? Would we be caught off guard like the Jews were caught in Damascus, Jesus, about the transformation that happens in the lives of the people we call friends and family and siblings and co-workers Will we be caught off guard, Jesus? God, would you destroy our doubt? Would you destroy our shame? Would you destroy our fear? Would we be bold to preach your good news? To be light and salt in the world, like Jesus said. Pushing back the kingdom of darkness. Jesus, for all of those who are in this room and for all those online, we ask in your name, power, and authority that the, that the voice and the schemes of the enemy against us and your good plans be silenced in Jesus' name. Every chain would be loosened in Jesus' name. Every fiery dart would be removed in Jesus' name. That we would lift up the shield of faith, trusting in our Savior who has conquered all of these things already anyway. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Jesus, we lift up that shield of faith and trust you that as you call us on mission, we do not go alone. You go before us, around us, beside us, and in us. 
and we will see the unlikely people come to you. And because of that, we will see peace. Not a superficial peace. Not a human-created peace, because that never lasts. A divine, a heavenly, a holy, beginning now, ending never, peace as your kingdom goes forth. Jesus, we ask big things these mornings, but you're a big God. If you can minister in Saul, who can't you minister to? We love you, Jesus. It is your love that propels us forward. It is your love that we are so grateful for. And it's your name we pray. Amen.